So the next step, the next way option for us to protect metals from corrosion is called cathodic protection. What is cathodic protection? Just imagine that I've got some metals and I need to protect, let's say, mild steel from corrosion. What is going to happen if I got a structure made of my steel and I connect uh, magnesium to that mild steel? What is going to happen to mild steel? What is going to happen to magnesium? Mild steel, mild steel will be okay, but the magnesium will be affected. Mild steel is going to be okay because mild steel is less active. Magnesium is going to be affected. Magnesium is going to uh, corrode much faster. Can I protect mild steel using magnesium? I can, providing that magnesium is not going to be the part of my component. So magnesium is going to be sacrificial structure. What is sacrificial? What is sacrifice? You give up something to save something or to save somebody, correct? Yeah. So, sacrificial means if I've got a mild steel to protect and I connect it to uh, magnesium, magnesium is going to corrode faster, but at the same time, mild steel is going to be protected, is going to be spared from corrosion. How it works? Just imagine that I've got two uh, components. One component is some kind of pipeline buried in the ground and that pipeline is made of mild steel. Another component is going to be a piece of magnesium. That piece of magnesium is going to be planted, is going to be buried into the ground at some distance from the mild steel and they need to be connected by a wire. Why do we need wire there? What is the role of this wire connecting them? Transfer the electrons. Transfer the electrons. So without that wire, electrons would not be able to, to go from magnesium to iron. What, where is the second part of the circuit? Where ions are going to which way ions are going to be transferred? Yes, so we are going to have the complete circuit by having the, we can call it bridge, salt bridge, within the ground. Electrons are going to move from more active magnesium to less active steel, and ions are going to be transferred to the soil. What is going to be happening with magnesium? Magnesium is going to rust, is going to dissolve. Iron is going to be saved. Why is that? Because iron is going to be given additional electrons. You remember that there is no such thing as magnesium electrons and iron electrons. They're all the same. So if magnesium is willing to give those electrons to iron, iron is going to resist the corrosion much better, but magnesium has to sacrifice itself. That's why they call it sacrificial anode. Magnesium will dissolve within, let's say it depends on the structure, but usually it would take few years, from few months to few years, for that magnesium to dissolve. Where we can use it? Well, if you need to protect your component, your metal, from corrosion, and there is enough medium outside to maintain the ion transfer. This is, that was my project, I did it back in Ukraine, I put some magnesium structure to, some magnesium uh, anode to protect structure that would not be protected otherwise, it was some kind of fence in a remote area and without that magnesium, that fence would rust much faster. <coughs> so that's piece of magnesium, that's a pipe that I would put inside, that's a hole in the ground, 
and I would connect, you could see there's a wire, I would need to connect that wire to the, to the structure that I need to be protected. You sure this is what we're talking about? It looks like a dynamite. No, uh, <laughs> it was well prepared, magnesium sacrificial anode. That's not my project, that's how it's done. You see the pipeline and you see the magnesium laying somewhere apart and you see wires connected to the magnesium. So magnesium itself is pretty expensive material, but in which way or in which conditions, circumstances, we are going to need that cathodic protection. It depends how much money or how much it's going to cost for us to repair the corroded component. Those pipelines, the material itself is not that expensive. It could be mild steel coated, mild, mild steel could be cast iron, but you need to put it into the ground and you need to connect it and you need to weld it. And you need to pump it, uh, you need to pump a gas or uh, oil or uh, the liquids to that pipe. If it corrodes and there's a uh, penetrating corrosion through, you will need a lot of money to repair it, to stop the process of piping, to find where it's leaking, to dig it up, to replace it, and to put it back into the ground. So in this situation, using this method called cathodic protection, it's going to be cheaper than to repair the pipe regularly. Where else we can use cathodic protection? Is that the, the transferring the element, the material, the element? To the uh, no, no, this is those wires, they're not transferring the material to the wire, they're transferring electrons Electric. to the wire. So they're giving those electrons, they're taking those electrons from magnesium and they're giving those electrons to steel. Remember, when I give electrons to a metal, metal will not corrode. Another approach, instead of getting the magnesium attached by wire at some distance from the pipe, I can actually uh, clamp it on the surface itself and it's used in marine applications. Let's imagine this is some uh, oil drilling station in the sea. They need to protect it. So what they would do, they would attach magnesium pieces to the steel and that magnesium would protect steel around at some point. If you check ships, vessels, boats, or their engines, very often you will find some funny looking pieces of metals attached to the surface of that. What could be that metal? Magnesium. magnesium. Why do they attach magnesium to the surface? Uh, it protects the steel. It will protect the steel material here. And it's not just steel material, it would protect even aluminum because remember magnesium is more active than aluminum. It will protect the steel around. How? Is it made from brass? Uh, I'm not sure about the material of the propeller. It looks a little bit uh, reddish in, in color, but most probably it's a mild steel. It's not a brass. Because back in the old ships, like the 19th century, in the brass one. Yes, but at that time, uh, not just for propellers, but a lot of elements uh, were made of brass. Today, it's <coughs> mostly uh, ferrous alloys with or aluminum alloys and with some special coating protection. So, why are we using many of those pieces? For the better protection. Well, for the better protection. Because it, it, it's not, it can't uh, protect all the space. So there's That's the true. So, you remember that there's going to be a current exchange in between the metal and the that sacrificial anode. That sacrificial anode is going to be magnesium, the metal is going to be steel. The current, the voltage of that uh, 
of that combination is going to depend only on the materials I use. It's like your lead acid battery. If you use some particular materials in your battery, the voltage is not going to be, it creates is not going to depend how much electrolyte, how big is the plane. The voltage depends on materials only. And that voltage is created by the difference in activity of the materials. So I cannot increase the voltage. If I, if I cannot increase the voltage, the current that travels in between the piece of magnesium and steel is going to be, is going to depend on the resistivity of the material itself, correct? So very often the voltage is very small. That voltage cannot create powerful current for those electrons to, to travel all the way around. So what we need to do, we need to flat those uh, sacrificial anodes more, let's say, with uh, some distance in between them to protect areas around. In that case, the metal is going to be protected. This is how that sacrificial anode looks like. What you see here is Z, what Z stands for. Zinc. Zinc. Actually, we've got two, the main popular or the most popular options. <coughs> we can use either magnesium or zinc. You could see here, those two metals, they are most active, they will save other metals. Can we use aluminium? <coughs> with mild steel. Yes, aluminum will corrode when we combine with mild steel. The problem with aluminum, if we want it to corrode, is actually self-passivation. Aluminum can, can stop corroding by pro protecting itself. So we need something more active, and magnesium and zinc are the most active options for those sacrificial anodes. This is how the new anode looks like. This is how the old or used one that in service. And those anodes, you could see, it's almost gone. What do we need for that anode to work? Mm -hmm. Yes, but we, we would not bother to clean it up. Remove it from here? Uh, no. Let's say it's, if it's a new, a new anode, what do we need there when installing? Connection. Connections. Yes. We need strong connection between the metal and the And we need to make zinc. sure that the connection is not corroding or like disconnecting. That's true. If, uh, if there is no connection here, those electrons, they would not be able to travel. So our anode is going to be useless. Michael, agree with us? <laughs> what is that stuff? Or copper. Is it? <laughs> if you find if you find something like that on your board, is it good side or bad side? Bad side. Bad side. Why? <laughs> so this one is going to be back aside. Well, it's actually sacrificial stuff. It's supposed to look like that, saving your board. If you study well, you go back to your country, you will buy a big yard and you will pay those engineers to protect it. And Most likely it's going to be plastic part of us. Anyway. Big yards for plastic? No. There is some need for the uh, fiberglass uh, hub. So if you see something like that sitting on your board, it's actually not a good sign. It means they do not work. But if it's like that, it means they have worked properly. You will need to replace it again, and they still need to grow to protect your expensive property. This is how it is going to be installed. Could be you could install it on your if you check board engines, they could have some pieces of magnesium or zinc installed through that, and it means that the, even the, the housing and components of the engine they are going to be protected. So, in most cases, we either weld it or we bolt it. Of course, for, let's say, for engine, there's some special holes, <laughs> you can bolt it. But for uh, 
a port hull, it's pretty difficult to maintain that uh, holes without leaking. So usually they weld it to, ma to create a strong connection here. And this is magnesium sacrificial or not. They come in different sizes, shapes. Uh, How much do they cost per kilo? It's not that expensive, but again, it's not going to be like mild steel. You are going to invest in, into that. Uh, but you are going to save a lot of money on maintenance and repair of your structures. This is how it's going to look. And you can even put this stuff, this some kind of shaft, rotating shaft, provided there is enough contact between the component and the shaft, it's going to protect even the shaft. But again, remember, it should be direct contact for those electrodes to be transferred. If there is no direct contact, if there is no conductivity, the, the stuff will not work. What is the problem with that? Well, remember, when magnesium corrodes, it's going to be electrochemical reaction. So what is electrochemical reaction? It means that some heat, yes, is going to be generated, and besides heat, it's going to be it's going to generate some chemical compounds. Some acids could be generated, some hydrogen could be generated, and what is the problem with the hydrogen? Anybody remembers? Uh, hydrogen. What hydrogen does to our steel? It breaks down uh, and brittlement. Hydrogen is so small, the atom of hydrogen, and it will actually go inside the steel, solid steel. Not the, you don't need to have it in molten state. It will go to the solid steel, and it will create micro cracks in the surface, and the steel under the stress will enlarge those cracks, and crack will propagate to the material. So, protecting your steel from corrosion at the same time, you create another problem. And this problem is evident around the sacrificial anode. Hydrogen created by that chemical reaction is actually uh, detrimental to coating of your boat and detrimental to the metal. So, could be. So, you need to weigh it what is more important for you, to protect from corrosion or to protect from hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Again, <coughs> proper coating of boats, it can prevent that hydrogen to go through the coating. Yes, you can say, uh, <laughs> Defend it from those hydrogen to go to the metal. But hydrogen atom uh, ions themselves, they uh, can dip, they can destroy many types of coating. This is the example. This is magnesium anode bolted to the structure. It protects from corrosion, but at the same time, the paint, the coating is affected by the chemical reaction and the hydrogen released from the chemical reaction of that. Now, that's called passive. Why do we call it passive reaction? What is passive here? Cathodic protection passive means that Surface of the metal. No. Do I have do, uh, do I have any external power source for this? Do I need any external power source? No. 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 So this reaction, this cathodic <laughs> protection or sacrificial protection, is maintained by the metals themselves. The electric current is actually created by the different by different activities of two metals combined together. So in this case, 
I do not need any external current. Those electrons, they're going to flow by themselves. You can imagine like uh, two vessels with a water and one vessel is going to be higher than another and the water will flow through that. I don't need to put any pump on that. That's passive. What is going to be active cathodic <coughs> protection? Just imagine that if instead of having just magnesium and mild steel, I would bury some other metals like platinum and I would put, connect them with a power source. What is going to happen? What power source is doing here? Power source is actually giving electrons from external source and those electrons they're going to be moved from one metal to another but they're not going to be extracted from this metal this metal works only as an electrode so that metal only maintains the flow of electrons but the flow of electrons is actually provided by external source. In this case, what is the advantage of this protection? It's still cathodic protection because the metal that I need to protect is going to be turned into the cathode and cathode will not rust. What is the advantage? The advantage is that this metal is not going to rust because it's not giving electrons. It's just the maintaining of that circle of flow or circle of life. Electrons are pumped from the external source by power and it's going to be only direct current. I cannot uh, alternate it in between, otherwise I will rust my uh, mild steel pipe. So in this case, the obvious advantage, I will not need to replace those electrodes but I will need to connect my structure to the external source what is the limitation of that somewhere in the remote area they could we would not have uh, power source we would rely only on passive protection but for areas when there is a power source we can rely on active protection and which metal we would use for uh, to have as an anode here. What would you put there? Um, you said platinum, but <coughs> Correct, platinum. Yeah. So, why platinum? Why to invest into platinum? And if you know where that platinum is buried, you can actually dig it up. Dig it up. It's much better than to go for a copper under the, <laughs> yeah, under the voltage. Yeah. So, why to use platinum? What do you think? Because the platinum, you said, uh, is the noble metal. Noble metal. Platinum will stay in the ground for a very long time without need to be replaced. Because if I put, let's say, mild steel, if I put mild steel here and mild steel here, and I put external metal, uh, external uh, source of electric current, will I protect one piece of metal? I will, okay, yeah, because I've got, I've got, regardless of the type of the metal, yeah. I no longer rely on their activity. I rely on the external power source that will reverse any activity, difference in activity they've got. So even if I put mild metal here, mild metal here, it's going to protect this pipe because electrons are going to be pumped uh, from the external power source, but this metal will rust, mild metal will rust sooner or later, and I will need to keep replacing it. So what I can do, I can put either platinum or gold there, they usually use platinum. Can you imagine having a big piece of platinum somewhere in the ground? Mm -hmm. They put platinum there, that platinum is going to stay for a very long time. What is going to happen, let's say, if that power source fails, and there's still connection in between mild, mild steel pipe and the platinum metal. So 
what is going to happen, what is going to be turned into. We are going to have passive cathodic. What is going to be protected? What is going to be corroded fast? The platinum will be protected. Mild steel will corrode much faster because platinum is going to take those electrons from mild steel. So we have to be sure that it is always current going through in opposite. It's like a pump. If I stop this pump, those electrons naturally will go from mild steel back to platinum. But if I keep that pump going, the pump will put electrons to the mild steel and those electrons, again, they are not going to be robbed from platinum. They are going to be provided by external, external, external source, yes. So, you, so when it's active, you're pumping electrons out platinum, but because the platinum draws out the electrons from the surrounding, is No, the that's not problem. correct. We are not pumping electrons from the platinum. We are pumping those electrons. They are supplied by external source. Platinum works only as a terminal for that exchange. So we are, we are having those electrons moving from the external source to this pipe, but we want another circle here for the ions to work in between mild steel and platinum. So those electrons and ions, they've got the circle and platinum is not going to give any electrons to that circle. It's like a water pump that has got, we've got not just enclosed circle, that we've got some external piping coming and providing that water that will travel through the uh, circuit. So in this case, it's not sacrificial anode. Platinum does not sacrifice itself for the sake of mild steel. So the existence of two metals is because of one connection because there's the two metals and then you know the electron side you just have to have the power supply in order to maintain the circuit but because there's an extra power source the That's wrong. Yes. So, external source of electrons is the DC current that comes into that circuit externally, not from, not created by the uh, metals themselves. This is how passive cathodic protection works. You could see this there is no pump here. Those electrons they move just because those elements they've got different potential. So ions moving here, you could see this positive, and electrons moving through the connection. Remember that voltage that we are going to register here depends only on metals we connect. It does not depend on the size, on the medium, just those two metals. You 
could see magnesium is going to pump those electrons more than any other material. So what is going to be impressed current or active protection? The same, but an external source of electrons, DC current. This is passive, it's sacrificial. This is active. So where we can use impressed current or active cathodic protection? First, we need a source of electricity. And second, we need those noble metals, electrodes, to work later. Where it can be used? Underground pipes, it could be used for ships as well. The question is, can we use either impressed or passive cathodic protection for our cars? What if you don't want your car to rust and you put some kind of piece of, or some piece of magnesium or zinc on your car? Is it going to work? That's what they say, rust evader, rust control. What this rust control uh, does, they say it's going to create some flow of electrons and it's going to protect your vehicle body uh, by that impressed current <coughs> method. Does it really work? Yeah. You can attach, just imagine that you need to protect the body of your car from rust. So what you need, you need to attach some, another electrode there, correct? That electrode is going to be either sacrificial if it's magnesium, or you can attach some noble metal electrode and you can put impressed current on that. Is it going to work? What do we need for our cathodic protection to work with? More. We need two parts for our reaction, electrochemical reaction. We need a path for electrons to travel, and at the same time, we need that salt bridge, or you mentioned water with salt, that will transfer the ions. What is going to be the problem for our cars? It's painted. It's painted, yes. So if I attach those electrodes to my car, yes, I can find some bare metal, uh, and I will attach it with the wire to the electrode and it's going to create that upper circuit of, for electrons to be transferred. But is there second part of the circuit? Do I have any water salt bridge to transfer ions in between? Unfortunately not. And that's why those rust dividers, they do not work. If you check website, uh, some kind of some some customer protection organizations they constantly tell you don't buy it does not work so but those companies they and some of them they they were they have been fined for selling the stuff that does not work for cars so what they did they changed the name 
and they sell it again. And they, they've been warned again that it's actually not honest. Rusty Vader, that's, the, I believe the site is still working. We can say that, yes. They've got, this is, it looks like our server is corroded. <laughs> CP, engineer, corrosion protection engineer. It's a big site and they say straight current interference. They're talking about cathodic protection for cars and they've got the conclusion even SIA International they've got they, they've done multiple tests on those equipment and they say it does not work and that's what they, they find the company if you can read it 200,000 US dollars for selling that stuff and promising that <coughs> this, this stuff is going to work. Again, it's pretty profitable. You sell something for $40 saying that it's going to stop corrosion from the car and there would be some people to buy it. The site is down for the company. Another, the Corrosion Society. This is another uh, highly reputable organization. They have tested rust, privilege, and those cathodic protection for cars, and they say it does not work. So be careful when you, when you ask, when you want to buy something uh, to protect your car from the corrosion. Because they do not work on our ground vehicles. There is not enough moisture on the surface to maintain that salt bridge for the whole loop of the reaction to be complete. <coughs> That's only about cathodic protection for cars. There's another way to protect it. Galvanization. <coughs> what is galvanization? Galvanization means that we coat our metal with layer of zinc. What it gives us, how active the metal zinc is. Is it more active than steel? Is it? So, if. so let's check. This is zinc and this is mild steel. What is more active? Zinc. So if I coat my, my mild steel with zinc, what is going to happen? Which material is going to corrode? Which material is going to stay intact? Zinc will corrode. Zinc will corrode, correct. So just imagine that this is going to be mild steel. If I find a way to coat that mild steel, not painting, but special way of coating, to put some layer of zinc on top of that, what is going to corrode? Zinc first. So zinc is pretty active. What we need to remember, zinc has got some self-passivation property as well. So zinc is going to create, when the oxygen comes,
zinc is going to create some layer of zinc patina on the surface of zinc itself. So zinc protecting itself from the oxygen, creating that patina. Zinc protecting the steel by coating, it's a prior coating, so whatever comes to the steel is going to be repelled by zinc. What is going to happen when the zinc is going to be scratched, the, the layer of zinc is going to be damaged or scratched? Let's say I got it like that. What is going to happen to the steel under it? Steel will be alright because the uh, rough part of the magia on the you know the steel still going to be alright. Uh, let's say within five millimeters within that scratch, zinc is going to give electrons to steel. Zinc will corrode here, but still is going to be protected. So even though the zinc coating is going to be scratched, it's going to protect the steel underneath or around that scratch by cathodic protection. That's why we call it cathodic protection, galvanization. So zinc has got three, le or three stages of protection. First, zinc itself, pro zinc protect itself by creating a patina on the zinc. Zinc protects the steel by having that layer of coating on the surface of the steel. And when the layer of coating is scratched, zinc is going to protect the steel by cathodic protection. That's why zinc is very popular way to protect ferrous alloys, uh, which <coughs> is steels and cast irons. So how we can coat, how we can protect mild steel with zinc? What we should do? Can we just paint mild steel with some uh, coating with zinc powder? Yeah. It's not going to work. We need very strong bond between steel and zinc. Remember, it has to give electrons through. If you put just powder into paint, the paint is not conductive material and zinc powder will not give electrons to metal. So they perform so-called hot deep galvanizing. What is hot deep galvanizing? You've got big piece of metal, you've got big bath of mold and zinc, and you submerge that metal. After cleaning, there's few stages of cleaning because the metal has already got that corrosion layer and zinc will not stick to that so you need to clean metal with some acids first and then immediately submerge it into molten zinc bath and that molten zinc is going to stick to the metal and is going to create very durable layer of corrosion protection many components are going to be protected. This is how it's done. They, you see they submerge it into the bath of molten zinc. They remove it and it's going to look shiny. It's not that shiny as a stainless steel. What is interesting? Zinc is not going just to stick to the surface of the metal. Zinc is going to penetrate that metal at some depth. Why? Because there's a chemical reaction between zinc itself and the steel. So just imagine this is the steel and the top is the zinc. What are those two layers in between? They call it intermetallic layers, means there's some 
chemical compound created by zinc and steel and those intermetallic layers they're going to have very good adhesion to both of them so you can see that zinc is not just coated on the surface zinc has reacted with the metal and has saturated the surface of the mild steel at some depth how deep just few microns there few micrometers but it's going to be enough for that zinc the top layer to stay uh, firm on the surface how thick is the zinc layer itself well it could be from few microns to few millimeters this is what they're measuring here here they measure the thickness of the <coughs> zinc layer. So what is good about that? You can use mild steel as a base material and you can galvanize it. So it's a cheap material, mild steel. Some layer of galvani galvanized layer of uh, zinc will protect it. And in some cases it could stay without corrosion for 40, 60 years. That's why when you see those, this is how zinc looks like. It's, it's not going to be absolute shiny like stainless steel. You could see those marks there. What do you think? What are those areas? Grains. They're grains of zinc. So when zinc is deposited molten zinc deposited on the surface of the metal it solidifies and it creates those grains so every time you see uh, those galvanized structures you could see the grains of zinc they will look like leaves like tree leaves grains of zinc bigger smaller on the surface <coughs> so will you say even if I sand to a sand no if you if you sand it, if you grind it, you will remove the zinc. What is what what, what is other disadvantage of zinc layer? You cannot use it at the high temperature. Zinc will not go above, let's say, few hundred degrees. Zinc is going to be more melted on the surface and it will be removed from the surface. So you cannot use it as a high temperature application. Brittlement, yes, if it goes, you know from your case, if it goes to the metal. Yeah. This is how it's done. Different big, big and small. And one of the easiest and cost effective way to maintain our structures without corrosion. This is big structure, uh, semi-trailer. You see, it should be done in special facility. If you are offered a job in that facility, don't go there, guys. Zinc is molten there, and there's a vapors, and there's a lot of uh, cleaning parts around with, with acid. Not the best place to work. This is big semi-trailer frame. They submerge it into zinc path. They remove it and it's already in play. So that's hot, deep galvanizing. It means that we need a molten zinc. We need some cleaning solutions. We clean the metal and then we submerge into molten zinc and zinc is going to stick to the surface of the metal, creating some intermetallic layers in between. Can we use it for our automotive applications? Yes, if we can afford it. Remember, mass production is all about the cost, cutting the cost. So uh, galvanizing is not the cheapest process. And galvanizing, it can actually increase the weight of your 
uh, metal that you use for vehicle bodies. So this is how a galvanized sheet of metal looks like. You could see those grains. Which cars or which components and which cars could be could have hot, deep galvanized bodies? Not many today. This is the first car. It's not, it was not Audi, it was Porsche in 1976. This Porsche 911 was the first mass-produced car with fully, full, fully hot, deep galvanized body. It's highly sought car today. It's very corrosion resistant. Again, if we perform hot, deep galvanizing or galvanization, it does not mean that that car will not require coating. The coating will go on top. And as a matter of fact, that coating is actually sticks better to, to the layer of zinc than to the bare metal, the ma uh, mild steel. So this car was produced by submerging those body components into part of molten zinc, and it's highly corrosion resistant. Uh, 1984 Ferrari 308 fully galvanized body. They call it Zincrox technology, but it's just the proprietary name for zinc hot, hot deep galvanization. And finally, what is most known for us and one of the most durable car body on the market except, let's say, for stainless steel and for aluminum Tesla, this hot deep galvanized Audi 80. When they produced this car in 1986, they initially gave 10-year warranty for penetrating corrosion. When they realized that this car can protect even longer, they increased that warranty to 12 years. So, pretty good. Approach, and this is Land Rover Parenti. Australia bought, purchased Land Rovers for their army, and they requested one point for that Land Rover. The frame should be hot, deep, galvanized. Why is that? The coastline in Australia, uh, salty. salty breeze, corrosion, they demanded that for this project, frame should be hot deep galvanized and Land Rover is capable this is uh, this is also a Land Rover 3x Land Rover with the fully galvanized frame underneath now can we have cars fully galvanized today it's highly unusual. Why is that? It still makes our car more expensive, much more expensive. You just make the carbon fiber car. Well, the car more expensive or not? Just carbon fiber. Of course, galvanized steel is much cheaper than carbon fiber reinforced plastic. It makes our car more aluminium. Uh, heavier. Yeah, aluminium is better. Uh, could be better choice. Uh, the if you put one square meter of metal uh, malt, malt steel, the coating itself, the, the uh, galvanization, could increase that weight of the metal by 300 grams it's, it's, if it's coated on one side. Two sides could go 600 grams. So you can imagine that your car is going to be heavier. The second point, the hot deep galvanization process is not that environmentally friendly. So they try, even today, they move from solvent-based paints to water-based uh, paints. So what we can expect today? Can we have, if it's not a special forces land rovers, can we have fully galvanized <laughs> car today? Highly unusual.
this is Volkswagen and this guy has got a body repair ma a workshop manual for his car and he checks it gives him indication which material is used in that building that body so you could see not all components are actually galvanized some of them are galvanized one side some of them are galvanized two sides so this is two sides this is one side and some of them are not galvanized at all so you could see that let's say bonnet or hood galvanized from both sides it's just an example does not mean that it's going to be the same for your car that's that i think it's volkswagen jetta cabrio golf here some components let's say doors front fenders galvanized one side only so other components they are not galvanized at all question is can i coat my car instead of making my car out of gold can i coat my car with gold let's say this is the metal and instead of putting layer of zinc I will put layer of gold there. Is it good good solution or bad solution? Or silver or platinum? It's good. Is it going to protect the car? No. No, because it's strong it's uh not you know the we talk about the the difference. It's just top there in the bottom there. Yes. Yes, but only if the coating is damaged. So if I got this coating firmly attached to the layer of the metal, those elements they are going to be shielded by gold, and gold will not let metal to rust. Correct. But what is going to happen if I cut? If I scratch the, the coating, gold coating, and the metal is going to be exposed here already, the metal will get rust more. The metal will get rust much faster because the metal is going to give electrons to gold. Zinc given electrons to metal to protect it when it's scratched. Gold is robbing metal of electrons, so novel metal coating could be good only if you can guarantee that the coating is not going to be damaged. In that case, electrons could flow between, but since there is no ion transfer in between, electrons would not go. Correct. But once you damage it, ions are going to be exchanged. Electrons are going to be exchanged. Remember, electrons they cannot move just by themselves. It should be the full loop of the reaction: electrons and ions moving. What else you can do with corrosion? Passivation. Passivation. Pass what is different between active and passive? Passive and active for metals. Active means readily given electrons and corroding fast. Passive means not participating in chemical reactions. Uh, no, in this case, no. Passive means that metal or material does not want, to, is not readily participating in chemical reaction. So how can I passivate the metal? Some metals, remember, they passivate themselves, the surface. 
Aluminium is very active, but aluminium oxide passivates the metal and protects it from corrosion. What I can do to passivate other metals that are not readily passivated by themselves? Remember, for corrosion, I need two, 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 two parts for the reaction. Ions and electrons. If I passivate, if I put some layer here, what I'm going to cut? What is funny, guys? Tell me. A lot of you are smiling. Uh, is it any, some funny term or? <laughs> During the class. Well, I hope it's not a hysterical laughing. Uh, like, like for stressed people. Well, if I passivate the metal, I can actually cut the upper layer, uh, the upper uh, upper part of the corrosion. Correct? How can I do it? I can actually treat the surface of the metal with some chemical with some chemicals that will create a layer of rust, but that rust will stay as a very firm and solid and strong layer on surface. What is the difference? What, what, if, uh, what is the problem with this rust staying on the metal? It will continue to rust. It will continue to rust because it's porous elements, water, oxygen can go through and this rust is going to peel away and this rust, the uh, corrosion is going to continue. What if I create some rust on the surface that is going to be very solid, not allowing any elements to go through and will protect the metal underneath? Can I do it? Yes, I can. Just imagine that I've got metal and I submerge that metal to some acid and let's say phosphoric acid, what is going to be created on the surface? Layer of phosphates. Phosphates is a salts of phosphoric acid, acids when it reacts with the metal. It's actually much stronger than normal rust. We can call it corrosion, but that corrosion will stay on the surface of the metal and you protect that metal from further corrosion. How they usually do it? This is the example. <laughs> this guy is skin gun owner. He even works in his workshop with a gun. Probably he, he also sleeps with his gun. <laughs> so what he's doing? So boiling acid there, he submerges that in there. barrel this is AK-47 barrel. It's a good quality steel, but it's prone to corrosion. So he submerges it put into the, uh, into the boiling acid bath and it smells the vapors. It smells, enjoys those vapors. And after that, he removes it out of the bath. And what we are going to see there, the acid has attacked the metal. There is a layer of corrosion on the surface, but that layer is very strong. It will stop for the corrosion from elements. And that parkerizing, it's a, a They've got different names for that process, depend, depending on the type of the acid they use and the type of salts that are going to be created. Uh, you can use 
different chemicals to create different layers and this is called let's say parkerizing it's a gray in color and it's going to have pretty good corrosion resistance after that this is what we need phosphoric acid and zinc phosphate you mix together and that layer is going to be not just corrosion but there is some zinc going to be deposited as well or manganese phosphate so manganese uh, is going to be on the surface as well in the zinc or manganese this is how parkerized surface looks like it's pretty dull it's not reflective and it's very popular for weapon because you don't want to have a shiny AK on the battlefield you will be noticed from kilometers away so depending on what salt you are using and what acid you can have either gray or black dark gray or light gray so dark gray is going to be manganese uh, manganese and zinc salts are going to be light gray you can use it for different ferrous alloys and it's pretty <coughs> it's pretty affordable process does not require zinc more than or more than zinc bar you can use to phos to uh, phosphate or uh, parkerizing for your vehicle components this is the uh, engine cylinder bore sleeve <laughs> what is the problem with that parkerizing if you look under the microscope that parkerizing la layer is going to be porous it's not solid like a zinc layer on a galvanized steel so what we what would you do to to close those pores polishing will not close those pores completely they use some not coating but they use some oil actually to go and to saturate into that porous uh, layer of phosphates and that layer of oil is going to stay there within the, the layer of phosphates and it's going to protect your material so after you parkerize it you need to spray some oil that oil will go and to fill those microscopic channels this is when the barrel is phosphorized and oiled what is going to how it's going to look like so he's got some components must have and he wants to protect them from further corrosion he's got that solution let's say phosphoric acid and salts of magnesium or zinc then he when the temperature is ready he submerges it into that more uh, into that uh, acid bath keeps it there you could see they were just metal and they turn in gray it means that the reaction coming or uh, reaction happening on the surface he removes them that's how it looks like and what he does sprays it VD40 why is that? Yes. to close those pores but what he's doing wrong? he needs to make it uh, dry first yeah. dry first that oil will not go deep enough if there's still liquid acid stain within the surface the porous surface so you need to dry it probably at higher temperature baking somewhere and after that 
uh, in the subcultural nitro oil or just spray with the 40 and it's going to saturate it all can stay can stay rust free corrosion free for years So guys, I've been told that there is no class for you after noon, correct? So you can enjoy class further, my class further. No, 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 we got class. We got class? Yeah, we're all different classes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what is left for us? Electroplating. Probably you remember from high school when you submerged some different metals into the solution of the salts and you put a current through one metal is going to be deposited each layer of another metal they call it plate electroplate we will discuss it next class so guys we don't have enough time for presentations today you no you hesitated in the morning i asked who is going to present there was 10 minutes I could not wait 10 minutes, guys. Is it a T?